If you would, let me encourage you to open up your Bibles tonight to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I hope this morning's message was uh, an encouragement to you. Think about the strength of God, the power of God. I think Jesus made it very clear in John 15, without me, you can do nothing. Relying upon God, the strength of God. The grace of God is inexhaustible. Do you believe that? I was reading a, a sermon, and I do that from time to time, concerning this particular topic about the sustaining grace of God, and someone said it's like saying to the little guppy fish, drink all you want in this lake. You'll never even come close to exhausting it. We think about the grace of God that God gives to us. We think about what is necessary in order to live our lives as believers. I hope that you understood this morning, and though we looked at the lives of King Saul, which is a little difficult, you see King Saul just continuing to make mistake after mistake, and then certainly comparing that with King David, who had his share of mistakes, though he was dependent upon God. We see to be strengthened or to be encouraged is when we get our focus upon the Lord, and we rely upon his strength. Next week, Lord willing, the message I'll be bringing in the morning has to do with the encouraging words that come through Holy Spirit-filled friends, the strength to stand. Isn't it good to have friends that come alongside of you and help you when you're feeling a bit down, when you're feeling deflated, when you're feeling, de when you're feeling defeated? And we're going to be talking about that. Now, Dave and I were starting to talk about it a little bit. I started preaching my sermon a little bit. I said, we need to stop. Tonight... I've entitled this sermon, Strengthened to Serve. Strengthened to Serve. I was thinking about this. Not that I was thinking about it for very long. But I was thinking about this. What if God saw fit in his sovereign plan, for whatever reason, to remove my ability to speak? I thought about that for a little bit. I thought, what would I do for a living? I can't do a whole lot. <laughs> I said, that's what God has given me by his spirit to, to communicate, to teach, to preach. I love doing it. And I hope you enjoy it from time to time, you know. Uh, that's what I get paid to do. But I do it because I love God, whether I get paid or not. And I was thinking about this as we, we think about Paul's we're going to come to that passage in 2, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul's thorn in the flesh. What was it? I'm not here to debate it. I'm not here to kind of give all these different theories. I'm going to present what I think the Bible is clearly teaching. Um, but regardless of this, there was something that Paul the apostle felt was hindering him, was a handicap to his ministry that God said, no, actually, I'm going to use it for you to become more dependent upon me so that you'll remain humble and I'll receive all the glory. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can question what God is doing in our lives, and we may not always understand it. I don't think Paul was deliberately trying to subvert the will of God. I think he was just honest. He was just, Lord, take this away from me. So Paul records for us that the, in the second time he writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the Corinthian church, an encounter that he had that was indeed personal. I've had people ask me, you believe the Bible is inspired. What do we mean by that? Well, the word inspired means, it comes from the Greek word theos, penuma. It means God breathed, that God indeed breathed in to the writers, and what they wrote was the very word of God. We believe that. That's one of the core fundamental doctrines of Christians. So, and that doesn't mean that when, you know, people like the Apostle Paul write in first person, that they're not writing based upon what God wants them to write. Because when we read this, we have to first interpret it correctly in order to make the correct application. And that's how we should do everything. Um, sometimes we take a verse out of context because we like how it sounds or it's, it's kind of our, quote, life verse or whatever. And we may not always understand it in its context like we ought to. Here we're going to read about an encounter 
that the Apostle Paul had, conversations, a conversation that the Apostle Paul had, that strengthened him to serve God in a greater way. When he came to a full understanding of God's plan. So I'd like to continue the theme that was given this morning during my sermon concerning the strength of God, the mighty power of God working in us. And I want us to think about the strength that is given when we acknowledge our own weaknesses. I don't think we always like to do that, do we? So what does it mean that God's power is made perfect in weakness? What does that mean? As we said this morning, the strength of God enables us to faithfully serve the Lord despite physical limitations and difficult hindrances. Paul's, quote, thorn in the flesh that we'll read in just a moment was given by our Heavenly Father for a specific reason, and we must keep that in mind. Satan tries to take things like a, quote, thorn in the flesh and use it as a way of antagonizing us so that we want to give up and not see God's sovereign purpose. We'll see that in just a moment. Humility is one of the greatest virtues of our faith in Christ. And Paul's thorn in the flesh was clearly given to him to keep him humble. He says that. He tells us that. In order for us to really understand the the verses that we're going to be focusing on, which will be 8, 9, and 10, we're going to read verses 1 through 8 before that, okay? So... um, If you have your Bibles and they're not already open, please open them, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll start reading in verse 1. I want us to ask ourselves this question. Do you, do we see the purpose of infirmities or what we might think are as handicaps or limitations, whatever or even whomever they may be? All right. Now, again, let's let's think about what Paul is writing here and, and, and what he's saying and why he's saying it. So he begins by saying, in this particular chapter, he says, it's not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. He's saying, I don't want to do this. But what I'm about to do is for your edification. I need to clear some things up. He says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Did Paul have visions and revelations? Of course. I mean, his conversion was unique. His other times, the different callings and different ways in which he received the gospel was by revelation, if you read that in Galatians chapter 1. I mean, so God was uniquely using the Apostle Paul. And there was some, some that still questioned his apostleship, still questioned his authenticity and his authority. So he says, I don't want to do this. It's not expedient for me, but I will to clarify some things. I, know, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. I think he's talking about himself. And so when we think about the third heaven, the first heaven would be the atmosphere of the earth, the second heaven is space, the third heaven is the abode of God. Okay, that's what he's talking about. So he had the unique opportunity to be in the very presence of God, and he's saying in verse 3, I knew such a man, whether in body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth, how he was caught up into paradise. This was a heavenly vision. Others have had visions like this, like Isaiah. But Paul goes on to write, and heard unspeakable words. Words that he could not understand. There's a language reserved in heaven. My Greek teacher thought it was Greek. And he would tell us that. He was just kidding, of course. But uh, he said, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. And verse 5, notice carefully what he writes. Of such an one will I glory. This was unique. Now, was he kind of beating his chest spiritually and he was kind of boasting? No, he was saying, I don't even want to do this, but I'm clarifying how God has used me so you'll understand how, in, in a different way how he's used me. So he says, yet of myself I will not glory. I will not boast. Well, what are the last four words of verse 5? Read it to yourself. But in Mine infirmities. The word infirmities is an interesting word. One of the root words comes from a Greek word that has to do with a hindrance in sight. 
That's why there's some that hold the position that perhaps Paul had some vision issues, and I respect that position. I don't necessarily think it was that, but I, re I respect it. That's why some people kind of hold to that uh, position. But nonetheless, the infirmity was a physical handicap. All right? And that's what it was. He's saying, he's saying, I'm going to glory, not in myself, not in all the revelations and the visions and the people that I've led to Christ and the messages that I've preached and all the persecution and suffering I've endured. He says, I'm going to glory in my infirmity. That does not seem normal. We would not normally boast in our weakness. So he catches the attention, I'm sure, of the Corinthian audience when this was read, as the pastor of the church at Corinth was reading Paul's letter, just like I'm preaching to you right now. It was being read, and all of a sudden, I'm sure everybody kind of was like, he's going to glory in what? He's going to glory in his infirmities? Is that what your Bible says in verse 5? That's what mine says. Verse 6 says, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or what he heareth of me. So this leads us to this section, starting in verse 7, where he writes, and he doesn't give specifics. I think sometimes we long for that. You know, I often think about, even if we knew the names of, of certain characters in the Bible, what would that matter? So now we know their name. If we knew that the names of the shepherds. Would that really change a whole lot that they went to Bethlehem and found the Christ child if their names were Bob, John, and Jim? So what? We want the details. We want all the information so we can debate it sometimes. It's like his thorn in the flesh was a physical handicap. There are those like John MacArthur who believes there was actually a person that this actually represented a physical person that was attempting to thwart the will of God. I don't necessarily believe that to be true. Um, and he uses it because of a, of a word that's in verse 7. But notice what it says in verse 7. He says, and lest I should be exalted above measure, meaning that, that I should be filled up with pride, that I should be viewed as if I was some type of demigod or whatever. Through the abundance of the revelations, all the things that happened to me, that was given to me, that was given to me a thorn in the flesh. This is what he's able to rejoice in. This is what he's able to glory in. This is what he's able to see as sovereignly ordained. This is not our natural reaction. This is difficult. Strengthened to serve. Sometimes God uses us in our weaknesses to show how powerful and how mighty he truly is. We must remember that God will magnify his name when we are humble. So Paul is not... Paul is talking about something that he endured. He didn't say, everybody's going to have a thorn in the flesh. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, God gave me a thorn in the flesh. For what purpose? For me to understand my humility. For me to have a proper view of myself. If you'll notice there, the thorn in the flesh is echoed by the words, the messenger of Satan. Now we look at this and say, oh, that's tough. The word messenger is an angelos in the Greek, and it, it's oftentimes used as a, as a, as a, a real person or, or an angel. And so that's why some hold to the position that it was actually a real person. But here I think it was just something that, was, that Satan was attempting, attempted, attempting to use to hinder the Apostle Paul's work. Then he goes on to say, to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. Do you see how he says that twice? So verse 8 reads, For this thing I besought the Lord, how many times? Thrice, that's three times, that it might depart from me. God's power is greatest when we are at our weakest. And what we need most in our weakness is God's sufficient grace, not more physical strength. We need God's grace that is sufficient for the very circumstances we find ourselves in. And this is so backward from how the world operates, isn't it? It's not how the world operates. It's not what the, how the world glories. We like to show off our strength naturally. 
to act like we've got it all together. But this is the opposite of God. His power is made perfect in weakness. We have to convince ourselves through submitting to God's spirit that this is so. That this is so. But what does he say in verse 9? It says, and he said unto me, well, who's speaking to Paul? Well, some of your Bibles may have uh, what's called a red letter edition. And we see that, the, that this is a conversation that he has with the Lord. This is a conversation that he has with the Lord Jesus Christ, who spoke to him at his conversion many years ago. It says, my grace is sufficient for thee. Would you read it with me? Let's read it out loud. For my strength is made in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, this is Paul now speaking, or Paul writing, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may what? May rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Tonight, I'd like to ask this question, why is or how is God's power made perfect in weakness? What does that really mean? I'm sure that you've heard messages before on this. I'm sure that perhaps you've studied it on your own, and I'm sure there's no, there's no lack of theories or, or ideas about what, it, what the thorn in the flesh was or all these different things, but here's the point tonight. I, I want to just share with you that God oftentimes is insistent on emphasizing our weakness to keep us humble, yes, but to reveal his strength in and through us. There are many times where people might say this, but believers in Christ, and perhaps even in this church, that say, I don't, just don't think I could do this. You know what? You're kind of on the wrong, you're on the right path, you just need to go a little bit further. That's right, you can't do it, but by God's strength and grace, he will enable you to do it. See, sometimes we might convince ourselves, or maybe we're convinced by other pressures around us to think that we're incapable of really doing anything that matters for eternity. But I don't believe that at all. I want to encourage you to be strengthened by God to do what he's called you to do, to be a faithful testimony, to be an encourager, to be a helper, to be a teacher, or whatever it is that God would have you to do. So this morning, or this evening, that is, I want us to notice four reasons why God chooses us, in our weakness, to perfect his strength. Number one, it means God gets all the glory. Amen? It means God gets all the glory. That's what it comes down to. And if you didn't figure that out already from what we've read, that's what he's saying, that God receives all the glory. To God be the glory, that in all things God would have the glory. Paul finally understood the purpose of his thorn in the flesh. It wasn't that he wasn't trying to glorify God before this. It wasn't that everything that he was doing was not right. He was saying, though, I finally understood what it was that God was doing in my life. The light bulb, in a sense, went on. By the way, if you're taking notes, the word thorn in the Greek is not like a small little thorn that you might find on a rose bush. This is actually the word that's also used outside of Scripture as a stake that was used to, to, uh, to stake into the ground for a large tent. This was a painful thing, not a, ouch, I, scratch, I scratched myself. This was, I remember watching this video of a, of, a, of a construction worker who somehow fell and was impaled by a, a, a large um, metal beam that literally went through him. And he's walking around with this thing, and, and they're trying to get him to, to, you know, get him into an ambulance, but that he couldn't even fit into the back of the ambulance, and they didn't know what to do, and it was, this was real. I mean, it looked like it was Hollywood CGI or something. It missed all the vital organs, but he, he literally had a metal rod going through his body. When we think about this, I don't think of, oh, a little inconvenient scratch when I think of thorn in the flesh. I think of something that had, was so serious that Paul prayed, he begged of God to remove it, and God said no, because it was a sovereign purpose for it. There was a reason why he had this issue, this, quote, handicap, this infirmity, this weakness. If I could sustain myself through, my tri through trials by my own grit and by my own determination, then I could take some of the glory. 
And that's not what the Bible teaches. I made it on my own, some people might say. I just buckled down and made my way to the finish line. But I cannot sustain myself in the slightest, and neither can you. God's grace is sufficient. He enables us to serve him faithfully so that God receives all the glory. If God wasn't behind me, and if God wasn't behind you, pushing you and directing you and helping you, then we all would head off towards apostasy at the first sign of difficulty. God sustains us. And this is what he's saying. Again, let's read verse 7 once uh, again. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You know, I think it's important to think about the fact that no one in heaven will be boasting of their own strength. You and I will be boasting about how God sustained us through heartache and tribulations. I'll be boasting about how God answered my desperate prayers for my wife and for this church at times, things I can't even talk about. Oops, sorry about that. I'll let the microphone thing dry out later. If God's grace alone is sufficient to sustain me, I can't take credit for sustaining myself. God does it all. And we will boast only in Him. Because God is capable of doing it. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 read, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercised loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Let's boast in our God. God's power is made perfect in our weakness, church, because it ensures that he alone gets all the glory. That's what Paul was understanding. That's what Paul was communicating. He wasn't just testifying this and so that the church at Corinth would be like, hmm, okay. They were like, all right, I see it. And I hope that you've come to that place too where perhaps God has given you a thorn in the flesh. I don't know. For Paul, I think specifically, it was some type of speech impediment. I think it might have been some type of problem that he had in communicating. In fact, if you were to read in another passage, I think it's in Galatians when he talks about his crude speech and how you received me, and, and there's some evidence of that. But I, don't, I can't stand solidly on that, but I, I think I lean towards that a little bit more than other positions. But nonetheless, there was something that he asked the Lord to take away from him, and God said, no, I'm not going to do that. Because there's a reason for it. There's a purpose that I have in it. Number two, not only does it, does it give God all the glory, but, but this, this strength is made perfect in our weakness, is, is accomplished in our lives so that it shines a spotlight on God's power. It, shi it, it, it shines a spotlight on God's power. God receives all the glory, but it's God in and through us, like we talked about this morning. If the Apostle Paul was capable of being exalted in his own mind, church, think about this, how easily could we be drawn away of our own self-importance? into not trusting in the sufficiency of God's grace and power. I remember hearing, I was at a pastor's conference um, a few years ago, and I was listening to someone share, sadly, a story about how a, how a man who was involved in the ministry, faithfully serving a church that seemed to be growing, seemed to be doing well, the numbers were there. He had fallen into sin. He was no longer in the ministry. In fact, I don't even think he was going to church. And somebody said this, he fell in love with his own voice. Fell in love with his own voice. Meaning, he liked to hear himself preach. He wasn't practicing what he was preaching. See, if we shine the spotlight on ourselves, who receives the glory? Not God. But when we shine the spotlight on God's power in us, that's why I was so convicted the other day when I was in my office and I was scheduling all these things and planning all these things, and God just convicted me. He just stopped me. I literally dropped my pen. I got down on my knees and said, Lord, may we be filled with your spirit. May we rely totally upon your strength and power to accomplish everything that we're going to do this year. Jeremiah thirty-two seventeen says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power, and stretched out arm. There is nothing too hard for thee. So sometimes we put God in a box and we act as though he's limited by our limitations. That's not how God works. I have zero ounces of sufficiency in myself and so do you. 
This reality is highlighted all the more when I am in difficult situations. I simply don't have the spiritual strength to keep going, especially when the Red Sea is before me and the Egyptians are behind me. (laughs) If everything hinged on me, I would utterly fail. However, God's grace, church, is sufficient. Amen? And God's omnisufficient. Sufficiency and power flow through His being, and God is able to guide me through the most difficult struggles. Verse 8, Paul says, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice. I mean, he says he prayed three times, and I almost wonder, like, if I was struggling with some type of physical limitation, I think I would probably say that I prayed 3,000 times. But he says three times. Maybe there was something specific that he did. Maybe, I don't know, you know, we, I don't want to read into it more than what he says here, but maybe there was, there was times when people laid hands on him. I, I don't know. But three different times he besought the Lord. Three different times he pleaded with God. Three different times he, he asked the Lord to remove this physical handicap, this infirmity. Look what it says in verse 8. That it might depart from me, that it might never come back. I don't want this, I don't want to have to deal with this. I don't want to have this limiting my ministry. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. For some of you, I know this is your life verse. Brother Ed, this is his life verse. He puts it on every email he sends me. And I appreciate that. I love this verse as well. And I'd like you to turn to Philippians chapter 4 if you would. Because I think we need to understand this verse in context. I think it's a verse that sometimes we, move, we, we remove it from its context and it sounds pretty good. I can do all things through Christ. So anything you set your mind to, you can do it, right? That's not what it's saying at all. Paul is talking about how the church at Philippi had blessed him. And starting in verse 10, he he writes, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. The church at Philippi was a giving church, I think very much like this church. Wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be what? Content. I know both how to be abased, which means to be humbled or not having a whole lot, and I know how to abound and having a whole bunch. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Who instructed him to do that? Who was teaching him to do that? God was. He knew it was of God. He was following the will of God, and sometimes he was hungry, and sometimes he had more than he needed, both to abound and to suffer need. Then verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. See, Paul was talking about some very serious and very difficult circumstances. And so if we're not relying upon God's power, we're relying on our own power, we could easily get discouraged. We could easily say, you know what, I just don't feel led of the Lord to do this anymore. And there's some missionaries. We we need to understand, Brother Tim, I'm sure, could tell you stories. We have missionaries that write in letters, and I weep sometimes over these letters of what they have to endure, what they go through. And I think many of us, uh, the first situation that happened, similar to what they, they write in these letters, we'd probably be on the next plane home. But they understand that God's sustaining grace enables them to continue to persevere because they love God and they love souls. It encourages, or excuse me, it shines a spotlight on God's power. So Paul was saying, I can't do this. We might even say, I don't even want to do this. But God helps me to do it for his glory. You see what he's saying? So therefore, he receives this thorn in the flesh to keep him humble, to keep him dependent upon God, to keep him dependent upon God. Let's go back to our text in in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So number two, God's power is made perfect in weakness because it places the spotlight upon God's power, not our power. We have nothing to glory in except God and God alone. I think too often times, maybe even if we're not careful, we might even testify about what, what we did, and God helped a little. Third, it encourages me to trust in God alone. Are there people that I can depend upon? Of course there are. But ultimately, my faith and my trust is not in man. It's in God. And I am dependent upon God's grace, his enabling power. So a thorn in the flesh is some type of physical infirmity. Uh, Satan's trying to use it to distract him and to to 
you know, get him off of what God wants him to do, buffets him, but God has given it to him for, to strengthen him. Verse 9, the conversation that he has with his Lord and Savior went exactly like this. This is what Jesus said to him. My grace is sufficient for thee. What's another word for sufficient? Enough. It is sufficient. And so Paul is saying that God's grace is sufficient. God's strength is made perfect. It's completed in him to accomplish what God has called him to do. Let's go back to the very beginning of this letter and look at chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. In these two verses that we're about to read, Paul, again, recounts a personal experience of one of his darkest moments in which God allowed, we might say, even ordained, perhaps, his circumstances to become so difficult and so desperate that he felt as if he had received a death sentence. Again, if, if you have your Bibles, we're, going, we're just going to go to the very beginning of this particular letter. Paul writes to the church, and he, and he uh, salutes them. And then as you continue reading, in verse 8, look, notice what Paul says. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above, what's the next word? Above strength. He's talking about his own strength. Pressed out of measure means kind of twisted and, contor and, and contorted in a way that would make it very difficult to move. That's what he was saying. We had no strength. Look what else he says. Insomuch that we despaired even of life. We could interpret this to mean that Paul was going through a very dark period in his life because of persecution. That we despaired. Now, I've heard people say that despair is turning your back on God. And I suppose if you live in that condition, there's truth to that. But he was saying, this is how we felt. It wasn't necessarily right, but it was real. He was sharing exactly what he was dealing with. It was very difficult. It was very painful. But notice what he says in verse 9, church. He says, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Paul was talking about a very difficult season of life. Sometimes we call them seasons uh, because we look back and say there was a period of time in which we went through a, a, a dark time or, or a difficult time. We call them seasons, okay? At least I do. He did, they didn't know if they were going to get through this season. That's what he's saying. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. It says that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. You see where his faith turned? He said, we were in a very difficult situation we had the sentence of death that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and, and doth deliver. He continues to deliver in whom we trust that he will deliver us. And so he testifies of how he was encouraged to trust in God alone. Have there been times when you felt like just throwing in the towel, quitting, saying, I just can't do this. I'm not sure if I want to do this. Why would God let things get so terrible? Sometimes we even ask ourselves that question when we are faced with troubling circumstances. God wants his people to know that he alone is their hope. And hopefully he is. And hopefully you run to him and see his sustaining grace. God leads me through the valley of the shadow of death, so I'll trust in him alone and cling to his sufficient grace. Listen to what it says in Psalm 62. The first two verses are, are really neat. David says, truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. When we think about it, it encourages us to trust in God alone. So God's power is made perfect in weakness because it encourages me to trust in God alone. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul continues to write this for the edification of the church at Corinth and for us to read it thousands of years later, for us to think about the struggle that we may or may not have in our lives, the difficulties, the, 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 the infirmities, the limitations, the, quote, handicaps that we think are there. God is saying, depend upon me for strength. Verse 9 again says, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
Fourth, I want you to notice in conclusion that God's power is made perfect in our weakness because it deepens, it deepens my trust in God. Next week, we're going to be talking about the fact that I believe that God does choose to use spirit-filled men and women, friends, church members, whomever they may be, to help us along our way. I think Paul even talks about a friend that he had. I wonder if he just called him O. Onesiphorus, I think is how you pronounce it. He said, he wasn't afraid of my chains. He often, what? What does the Bible say about him? He often refreshed me. And I think it's important to understand that, that it's good to have friends that help us. It's good to have people that come alongside of us. I, I think it's wrong to kind of get to this idea that, that you can't have any other people that, 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 that you're close with that you, can, that you can depend upon. But ultimately, people, sadly, at times may fail us. But God will never fail us. So it deepens my trust in God. When I see the sufficiency of God, when I see his steadfastness, when I see his faithfulness, See, the Apostle Paul experienced the power of God's enabling grace and gave testimony of that grace so much that he delighted in difficulty so that Christ's power would rest upon him. So as he writes this church, I know we all know how it ends, but, but as we come to this place, when he says in verse 9, most gladly, therefore, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in, mine infirmity, in my infirmities that the what may rest upon me. The power of Christ. He's seen it sustain him in difficult seasons. He saw the faithfulness of God deliver him and continue to deliver him. God kept him alive for a reason, for a purpose. I think Tim and I were talking about this not too long ago, that Paul may have died and, came, and God chose to bring him back to life. And we look at this and say, God has a purpose for you. Are you fulfilling that? Are you strengthened in your walk with God when you remember God's goodness? I had somebody ask me, how do you know that King David prayed and, and did what you said? Well, I think that's consistent with what the Bible teaches people do when they're encouraging themselves in the Lord. They pray. They sing praises. And they remember. And if you don't have the greatest memory in the world, get a piece of paper, get a notebook, and write it down. Go back and look. See, we do that all the time with Facebook, don't we? We get a, a, a picture of something that happened or a post of something that happened from many years ago. We go, I don't even remember writing that. I don't remember taking that picture. And all of a sudden, we share it. And all these people liking it. Sometimes we forget what God has revealed to us. Remember when God was faithful. Remember when God helped you. Remember when God strengthened you. Oh, yes, I do. King David, I believe, did that. He encouraged himself, he strengthened himself in the Lord, and he was able to do what God wanted him to do. How does it deepen my trust in God? Albert Barnes said this, the removal of the infirmity might be apparently a blessing. However, it might also be attended with danger to our spiritual welfare. I was reading this, I thought, interesting. The grace imparted may be of permanent value and may be connected with the development of some of the loveliest traits of Christian character. Ultimately, God knows what he's doing. So he says in the end of verse 9, I'm going to glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me so that I may be, have a deeper, deeper trust in God, that I may see his goodness, that I may see and experience his blessings. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is what? The Lord is good. Have you tasted? Have you seen? We go to Sam's Club. People have asked me, how much money do you spend when you have seven, seven little ones in your home? Little ones. I shouldn't say that anymore. They're not little. Some of them are. You go to Sam's Club. I am not shy with the free samples. I, go, I give thousands of dollars to this place. Grab as many as I want. And we take the free samples, and they're like, T taste, try it out. I think I will. Is this good? It's cheese. I've never had it before. And we eat it, and we're like, maybe I'll buy it. Usually we don't. We keep going. And we experience God. What is our testimony? Why is it sometimes we don't give testimonies? Uh-oh, it's gotten kind of quiet here. I'm a little shy. Okay, I get that. What's God doing in your life? 
Are you seeing God's hand of, of direction? Is it God's power sustaining you? Is God working in your life? You shouldn't have to think far, that far back. It should even be perhaps even the ride to church tonight. It's so easy for us to fall into the temptation of trusting in our own understanding. Relying upon God rather than, I mean, relying upon ourselves rather than relying upon God and his sufficient grace. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall, what church? Direct thy paths. I think that's why Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 exhort, exhorts us to, not, or to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and not to lean on our own understanding. Deepen your walk with God by experiencing God and seeing him prove over and over again his faithfulness and his sustaining grace. When I lean on my own understanding, I'm failing to trust God. Nothing will come about with that. Therefore, God's power and ability to deliver are far beyond even sometimes my own understanding. And this is what Paul understood. Look at verse 10. Therefore, that's, a, that's a, a word that's kind of used to kind of summarize everything that we've been just talking about. Therefore, as a result of everything that I just said, I take pleasure. I think apart from God's grace and his enabling power, I don't know why we would ever say this or why he would ever say this or why we would say amen to this and agree with it or want it. That's why I began by saying, what if I couldn't talk? We used to have a softball league back in the day, men's softball league. Remember that, guys? And um, one of the pastors of the churches that was in our league, there was a church in Lowell, Fifth Street Baptist Church. He was blind. God used him in a great and mighty way. Good guy. I remember talking to him. We think about different things, different handicaps, different limitations, Again, we don't know exactly what it was that Paul's thorn in the flesh was, but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was some type of limitation. But look what he says in verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in what? What does he say? I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches. Infirmities are, are difficult uh, experiences. Reproaches are, the, are what's said about them. In necessities and, and needing things and persecutions, which comes through people. In distresses, being helpless. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. So Paul was saying, I needed this. I needed this. But are we greater than Paul? He said, I don't need that. I don't want that. <laughs> Trust me, Lord, I'll be strong. I really will depend upon you. I don't need to go through all those things. But Paul maybe thought that way too. Lord, let me glory in your healing power. And then he gloried and what he thought was the worst thing that ever happened to him. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God. Charles Spurgeon said this, Let us lean on God with all our weight. Let us throw ourselves upon his faithfulness as we do our beds, bringing all our weariness to his dear rest. Some of you may have remembered a guy named Jesse the Body Ventura, who besides his lackluster wrestling career, he became the governor of Minnesota. I think he was the governor of Minnesota while Andrew and I were in Bible college in Wisconsin. We had some Minnesota students that uh, were still amazed that somehow he became the governor. And he insulted every religion one time when he said, religion is just a crutch. Does anybody ever remember him saying that? Or Okay, I guess it wasn't that big of a deal. But I remember him saying that because it was something that was brought up in a, in a chapel message by one of the preachers that we had from one of the pastors from a church in Minnesota. And the preacher said, oh, it's not a crutch. God is my wheelchair. He's everything. <laughs> you know, it's, it's sometimes there's people who don't understand what it means to be totally dependent upon God and try to insult us by saying we're just dependent upon God because we can't get along in life. Lord, I need you. I need you. I can't do anything without you. Call it a crutch. Call it a wheelchair. Let us lean on God with all of our weight. When I continually trust 
and the sufficiency of God's grace. I am proving his faithfulness to strengthen me so that I may serve him. That's all that Paul wanted to do. That's what he wanted to do. That's why he says, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, and persecution and distresses. For Christ's sake, I'm doing this because I want to serve God. And God has saw fit to humble me through this thorn in the flesh so that I may be of greater use because God knows best. Therefore, God's power is made perfect in weakness because it deepens my trust in him, because it helps me to realize I can't do anything. And I was convicted of that just the other day in my office. Not that I had thought about it before. I just was convicted about it in a deeper sense. It literally halted my tracks. Stephen Curtis Chapman wrote a song called His Strength is Perfect. About an hour or two ago, I asked Andrea if she would be willing to sing it you know, tonight. She said, maybe another time. I'm not going to sing it, so I don't want to clear the audience here or clear the auditorium, but I want to read it to you. He, he writes, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, but sometimes I wonder what he can do through me. No great success to show, no glory on my own. Yet in my weakness, he is there to let me know. Here's the chorus. His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll carry us when we can't carry on. Raised in his power, the weak become strong. His strength is perfect. His strength is perfect. Here's the second verse of the song. We can only know the power that he holds when we truly see how deep our weakness goes. His strength in us begins when ours, where ours comes to an end. He hears our humble cry and proves again. His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll carry us when we can't carry on. Raised in his power, the weak become strong. His strength is perfect. His strength is perfect. And it doesn't mean that we exhaust ourselves and then say, okay, God, can you help me now? Sometimes we do that, and we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't say, I tried everything. I guess we should have a prayer meeting. We should seek God first. This is proactive, saying, Lord, I can't do anything but you can do great things in and through me. And again, I don't want us to think about just what we sometimes call ministry things, but everything that we do. Being a father, being a mother, being a husband, being a wife, being a worker, being a servant, being a believer, being a child of God, everything, everything. We need the strength and power of God. 